Okay, we are continuing with our study on the Apostle Paul. And when we left Paul, we left him in Troas in the middle of a sermon. It's kind of a rude thing to do, isn't it? Here the guy's trying to preach a sermon and we up and walk out the door on him. Um, and, um, but anyway, this, this, was, this is where we left him. Now, I want to remind, I want to bring us back to, to remind you of something that's, that's uh, uh, so that we know who he's there, who is there. At the time that Paul was teaching in Troas, the other disciples that had been traveling with him had gone on ahead to Ace. They weren't with him. They'd gone on ahead. And we're going to see that this morning as we move on. But I want to remind you of who these people are. Um, it says in verse 4 of chapter 20, and there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia Tychicus and Trophimus. Um, they'd gone ahead and, and, and tarried at Troas, and then they, they and, and then Luke, they had gone ahead, then Luke and Paul, after the Passover, sailed to Tro Troas to meet them, okay? So, and that's, that's where we were at all, all the first day of the, of the week. Um, now this is, a, this is an important point that's going to have a lot of bearing on something that we're going to get to in a couple of weeks. Um, this isn't in your outline, but over in 1 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus. But wait a minute. He sent Timothy on to Macedonia while he was waiting in Ephesus. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. Um, See if I can find it. In chapter Acts 19, verse 22, So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Tim Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Well, how does that make sense? How is it that in the Bible, the only time that Paul is ever in, there's only two times he was ever in Ephesus. The first time he was only there for a, a few, very short period of time because he was trying to get to uh, Jerusalem for the Passover. That was on, on his second trip. On his third trip, he spent three years in Ephesus. So how is it that he left Timothy in Ephesus and he went to Macedonia when we're told that he sent Timothy to Macedonia while he stayed in Ephesus, and according to the book of Acts, that's the only time he was ever in Ephesus again. How does that, how does that tie together? You see, this is one of those places where if somebody that doesn't believe the Bible is going to say, well, see there, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, it is the opinion of most of us, and, and, and I will get to it when we get there, that Luke finished his, his writing of the book of Acts when Luke left Paul in Rome. We'll see that when we read the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. Um, but he still had three or four years left from the time that Luke left until Paul was, was martyred under Nero. And so it's my contention that during that two or three, four years, that he didn't just sit there in Rome, that he did what he was called to do and he went back out and kept preaching. We just don't have it recorded in the Bible. But there are hints throughout all of these letters that there's a bunch of stuff that he did when he writes his second letter to Timothy and explains some of the things that he had been doing during that interval that makes it look like, well, he went to Ephesus again 
He went back through Macedonia and into Corinth again. He sailed to Spain. He probably saw Britain. Somewhere along the way he was arrested. Now I've got that all put together and I'll, I'll deliver it when we get there, but I just wanted to make that real quick point in case every, anybody caught it along the way. That Timotheus at this point in time is still traveling with the Apostle Paul. It's not until later that he's left in Ephesus and it's even later than that that he writes that Paul writes the letter to Timothy and that's going to be important in a couple of minutes when we when we get to to another point so that's who's traveling with him um, so let's see where where are we verse chapter 20 we saw that they met on the first day of the week in verse 8 and there were many lights in the upper chamber Oh wait, let me continue this. And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Continued his speech and to be thankful. I don't keep you here till midnight. I usually get you out of here by noon. I don't go for another 12 hours. I don't know how you do that. Men had a gift. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen asleep into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. This is why we only have one level. So if anybody goes to sleep and you fall out on the floor, chances are you're going to be okay. Because I don't have the gift that Paul had. Um, this is surely the sign of a gift of, of an apostle. Um, what's going to happen here in a moment. He was taken up dead. Verse 10, And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Not a little comforted. That's an interesting way to say they were pretty happy about, about all this. So Eutychus passed, falls, out of, falls three, three floors down, lands on the ground, and it kills him. And Paul lays on him. Now this is, this is one of those gifts that the apostles had. Um, they're not applicable to us today. We don't have this, these gifts. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds, Raising somebody from the dead is kind of a mighty deed. It's a pretty mighty deed to be able to do something like that. Um, in Matthew chapter 10, and I think I told you the story about when Wendy and I lived in Reno one time when someone had had an epileptic seizure. He hadn't died, but he, he had an epi epileptic seizure in one of these charismatic churches and they fell on him. They thought he had a devil and they they, they all pressed him until they finally smothered him and killed him. Kind of the opposite of... See, these are gifts we don't have. This passed out with the apostles. They had these gifts, not us. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5 through 8, and this is when Christ is speaking to his disciples, which then became uh, uh, apostles. Um, he says, Verily I say unto you... Oh, is that the right place? 10... Verse 5 through 8. These twelve sent Jesus forth and commanded them. These are the apostles with, with the uh, exception of Paul, of course, but with the inclusion of Judas. Um, go, into the way of the, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into, into uh, any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have you received, freely give. This was a gift that was given to, to the apostles, and here Paul 
is utilizing a gift that was given to the apostles. Look at Acts chapter 9, where we'll see another apostle. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. You know, if you look up that word Tabitha, the, it means Dorcas. This is one of those examples where when the Bible interprets something, it always interprets it in its primary meaning. That's what Tabitha meant. That's, that's what it means. It means Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber, and for as much as uh, Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter, Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And when Peter arose and went with them, when he was come, they, they brought him uh, into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by we, him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made while she was uh, with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And her eyes opened and, when, and uh, when she saw Peter, she sat up and gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. So you see, here's another apostle with the ability to raise the dead. Now, as I'm going to say in a couple of minutes, it wasn't his ability. He had the gift. God was the one that did the raising of the dead. It wasn't Peter or Paul, but it was. But 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 they had the they had that they had the gift. Um, during the earthly ministry ministry of Jesus Christ, there were several that were raised from the dead uh, by him. Look at Luke chapter seven. Verses 11 through 15. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. So Christ raised the dead on several occasions. Look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 41 through 42. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. Uh, but as he went, the people thronged him. And then looked down at verses 49 through 56. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. So the ruler goes to Christ, and by the time he finally gets to him, the daughter's already passed away. She's already died. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, and took her by the hand, and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she rose straightway, and he commanded her, commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. So that was another occasion. Look at John chapter 11, where we have the case of Lazarus. John chapter 11, beginning at verse 21. 
This is after, after the Lord's been called and told that Lazarus was dead, and he arrives at, at, their, at their house, and then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know, this is an interesting point to think about. The believer never really dies. Our body might die, but our soul lives on. And it's instantaneous. We don't fall over dead and that's the end. We don't go to sleep for a hundred thousand years. No, we just change location. Our soul and spirit go to be with God at the same instant that our flesh dies. So we really never die. We just move. That's all. And the really nice part about it is that there's a moving van that comes and picks us up and takes, all of, takes us with them. We don't even have to pack. We just move. So when we leave this world, we just change location. We don't really ever die. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when he had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. One of the shortest verses in the Bible. Then Jesus said to the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Or then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay before it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for it's been four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about um, with a napkin. So you see, Paul raised the dead by the power of God. Peter raised the dead by the power of God. Jesus Christ raised the dead by the power of God. And then we have Christ himself being raised by the power of God. I'm not going to take the time to turn all the passages, but there's Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 6 is one. Mark 16, 1 through 6 is another. Don't worry, you'll get a copy of this outline. Uh, Luke 24, 1 through 9 and John 20, 1 through 10. Three different occasions of, of explanations of Christ being, being raised. And then we have some examples over in the Old Testament. In, uh, in 1 Kings, First Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 17. Oh, that's Second Kings. Uh, 
That's right. And this was uh, Elijah when he had traveled into Zarephath and was staying with the widow. It says, And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sick was, sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I done? Uh, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. So we have the case of Elijah with the, son, with the widow's son. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 18, beginning at verse 18, And this is speaking of Elisha. And when the child was grown, it fell on the day that he went out to his father and to the reapers. And, and he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out and called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It's neither new moon nor the Sabbath. Why are you going to the preacher? And she said, It shall be well. And she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel, and it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said uh, to his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Um, and so, to make a long story short, Elijah raised this young child, well, God raised him at the request of Elijah. And then we have a case in 2 Kings chapter 13, and this is a this is an interesting one. This is after Elisha has died and he's buried. And in 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 20, And Elijah died and they buried him and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming of the end of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Well, that's an odd one. Not exactly sure what the point of that one was, but it's in there. But you see, in all of these cases, what I want you to see is that in all of these cases, it was God that raised the dead. It wasn't the men. Paul couldn't go around and just raise people from the dead. It was God that did that. Um, they had a gift, true enough, and they prayed to God and God answered their prayer. It was God that gave life. You know, man has never been able to give life. With all the science that we have, he's never been able to, invent, to, to come up with how you go about inventing life. It takes God to bring life. Not only when it comes to physical life, but also when it comes to spiritual life. Man cannot create spiritual life of his own. It takes God to give man spiritual life the same way that it takes God to give man physical life. Man can't do it. Man can't earn it. Man can't any more than he could come up with life by himself. I remember when I was a kid, 
there was a, a movie that I that I wasn't supposed to watch. I guess I sinned, didn't I? I went against my parents' wishes, and I watched the movie The Bride of Frankenstein. I don't know if any of you remember that. If if I were to watch it today, I would laugh hysterically. Well, we still do. <laughs> but then, when I was a little kid, that gave me nightmares for months, because here they had invented a way to bring life to dead souls, dead flesh. Well, but it's, but it's a fairy tale, it's Hollywood. Man's never been able to do it. Only God can do it. And it's the same way when it comes to spiritual life. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It takes God to bring about life whether it be physical or spiritual. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he, may, hath he reconciled. And in, verse, in chapter 2 and verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So it takes God to bring about life, whether it be physical or spiritual. You can come up with all the different concoctions you want to try to come up with or plans where you can go about getting life yourself. It's not going to work. Unless God's involved in it, I'm sorry, it's just not going to work. So the, the answer that I've always used to, to street preachers when I was a kid, the, You'd run into them at the Redondo Beach Pier and they'd be saying, well, do you know Jesus? Well, it doesn't matter if I know Jesus. The question is, does he know me? Because if he doesn't know me, it doesn't do me any good if I know him. It's only if he knows me. And it's God that gives life. Okay, now let's get back to our, get back to our study here. Um, at verse 13 of, Roman, or of Acts chapter 20, we now see um, we now see where those traveling companions of him that we talked about earl earlier have didn't stay in Troas while Paul was preaching in Troas they'd gone ahead in verse 13 it says uh, and we went before to ship and sailed into Asos there intending to take in Paul for so he had appointed minding himself to go afoot so he'd already sent them on to the next town while he was in Troas preaching. Then he was going to walk from Troas to Asos, um, which is about 20 miles. Pretty good hike. Take you about a day to do something like that. Not, maybe not a whole day, but take you, take you a, at least, you know, a while anyway. So he walks from Troas to Asos. Um, Verse 14, and when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. So they traveled together now to Mytilene, which is about another 40 miles. And in verse 15, and we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium and the next day we came to Miletus. So they traveled <coughs> to Chios, which is 70 miles um, by ship. Then they went to Mytilene, which is another 40 miles, and then from there they went to Samos um, and stayed at Trogilium. Now Samos is a Greek island in the eastern Aegean Sea it's separated from Turkey by about a mile. There's a, about a one mile straight, <coughs> excuse me, between this island and the mainland of Turkey. Um, and Samos is, was the birthplace of the mathematician Pythagoras. You heard of him from your college days, and it was also the birthplace of Epicurus, who was a philosopher. They were both from this Greek isle. Um, Trogilium was a coastal city in what is now modern Turkey. It was Asia at the time, but 
but uh, modern Turkey it's across the strait. So you've got the island, they sail to the island but they actually stay on the mainland in Asia in Trogilius and Samos is right off the right a mile off the off the the, the coast there. <coughs> and then they're going to head on from there to Miletus. Um, which is what verse 15 said. They sailed thence, came the next day over to Chios, the next day arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. Um, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. He wasn't going to stop at Ephesus um, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hastened, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So to take the extra time to go back to Ephesus again, he wasn't going to do that. He was going to stop in Miletus because he was trying to make his way to Pentecost, um, make, make his way to Jerusalem by Pentecost. Now you remember that when he was in Philippi, and we read about it in verse 4, uh, of the same chapter, there accompanied him into Asia, so Pater of Berea and, and the other men. Uh, verse 5, these going before tarried for us at Troas, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So he was in Philippi at the Passover. He wants to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. There's roughly 50 days between Passover and Pentecost, so that helps you get the time frame of he's moving fairly quickly. He's not spending a lot of time here. That's less than two months to travel from Greece to Jerusalem in the first century. And a lot of it and a lot of it involves walking. So he's he's moving at a pretty pretty decent clip. And that's why he didn't want to take the time to, to go another 45 miles north by land to try to get to Ephesus. So he sails by Ephesus and goes on um, to um, Miletus. Um, that brings us to verse, what's, oh, let me make a couple of points here real quick. Pentecost, Pentecost is one of the three major feasts that Jews were required to attend. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, and verse 16, it says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread, that's Passover. In the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, they, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So this was, these were the three feasts that men were required to go to Jerusalem for. Um, which explains one of the reasons that he wants to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost. This is one of the feasts when he was, when, when he's, supposed to be there. Now there, there may be something else to this also. Um, since that's where when all the males are going to be there and Paul is carrying money that he's gotten from all of these other churches it kind of makes sense that you get there at a time when there's going to be more people to benefit from it than less. Doesn't it? You're going to have people coming in from all over. So so that, that I don't know Bible doesn't say it, I'm just thinking out loud, but it's possible that that might have been part of what was on his mind. Um, there's a couple of other areas. The, this, this passage in Deuteronomy stresses those three pilgrimage, pilgrimages that, that the men are supposed to make. In Numbers chapters 28 and 29, those emphasize the different offerings that they're supposed to bring with them. It says that you're not going to go empty-handed. Numbers tells you what you're supposed to bring with you. Um, and Leviticus focuses on the actual feasts themselves in Leviticus chapter 23. Um, we're not going to take the time to read that. It's, it's, uh, it, it, those are just minor points. Um, now we have an occasion where Paul meets with the Ephesian elders. 
beginning at verse 17. Now, I'm not going to drag everything out of this, um, but there's a there's a couple of points that I want to that I want to emphasize as we look at it. Um, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So he sends word to Ephesus to for the elders of the church to meet him in Miletus. Now. Um, this word elders here comes from the Greek word presbyterios, and we're going to look at that in just a couple of minutes. Um, and when then, it's about 45 miles, so you figure if he sends people, if they go by foot, um, it's going to take them a day and a half to get there and then collect all the people, and then they've got to hike all the way back. So that, that's a few days. Uh, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept nothing, and kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. He'd been hearing this for a long time, and, he, and as you're going to see, he's going to continue to be, be warned relative to what's going to happen when he shows up in Jerusalem. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of God. And he's speaking to these elders, these presbyterios, um, and, then he, and, this, and then he gives this instruction in verse 28 through well, let's just start. Let's just look at verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. The yourselves is referring to who? The elders that had come from Ephesus. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God with the, which he has purchased with his own blood. I want you to look at a passage over in 1 Peter chapter 5 where we see much the same type of a statement. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 3. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Sounds a lot like what we just read, doesn't it? Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Peter's saying pretty much the same thing that Paul is saying. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, here's the point. They're not charged with trying to save the entire world. Paul did not charge these elders with going out and trying to save the world. That's not what they were charged to do. It was not the job that was given to them. They were, it was not their duty to make names for themselves and become celebrities. That was not the charge that was given to them. Um, there, it was their job and their duty to take care of the portion of the flock 
that the Holy Ghost had put underneath their charge. Nothing more, nothing less. So if the Holy Ghost gives a man a church with five people in it, then it's his charge to take care of those five people. And if he gives them a church with 120 people in it, then it's his charge to take care of those 120 people. But it's not his charge to go out and try to make a name for himself or go out and try to populate heaven. That was never the charge given to, to an elder. That's not what our job is. We're to be here to take care of the folks that God puts under our charge. That's simple. Um, well, it's not simple, but that's the charge. Okay. Now, this word elder comes from uh, the Greek word presbyterios. It's the title of the office. Uh, the Greek word is defined as pertaining to being relatively advanced in age, older, old, or to an official, an elder, a presbyter. The word presbyter in the English language, in the primitive Christian church, an elder, a person somewhat advanced in age, who had authority in the church and whose duty was to feed the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made him overseer. Pretty good definition. That's from, from Noah Webster's. Um, if you talk to Elder Ben Mott, or if you had have spoken to Elder Conrad Gerald, um, and asked him this question, both of them would give you the same answer, that they were ordained way too young. Elder Gerald was 23 years old when he was ordained. Elder Ben Mott was 18. He was 18. That's not an elder, folks. That's not someone advanced in age. This man was thrown into the office because primitive Baptists would do that. They'd take a man when he was just a kid and turn him into an elder, make him a pastor. And, and he, I can't tell you the number of times that he's bemoaned to me the idea that he would have to sit down with a couple that had been married for 25 years trying to counsel them as to what they should do with their marriage and he'd never been on a date before. <laughs> I'm of the opinion that elders shouldn't be kids. I won't ordain an 18 year old to take this job. You're not ready. You're not ready for this job when you're 18 years old. You haven't lived enough. Those of us that have lived a while find out, you know, one of the things that, that I noticed, I, I apologize to my uh, older son, since I only have two, um, when he left for the Navy. And I told him, <laughs> told him, Blake, I owe you an apology because your mother and I were pretty strict on you. We were a lot more strict on you than we were on Josh. But part of that was because we didn't know what we were doing. Quite frankly, when you're a parent the first time, you don't have a clue as to what you're doing. And everything they do, you think they're gonna kill themselves. And, and after the first one gets through it, you figure, well, the, second, the first one lived through it, the second one will probably live through it, and you end up being a little easier. It's the same way with guys that get in the ministry when they're too young. They're just, they haven't lived, they haven't experienced life. Uh, and it's real easy to make judgment calls on things that you've never experienced before. Um, only that when you have actually have experienced things, they look a little different. It looks a little bit different when you're the one that's actually having to do it than, than the theory. Uh, so I'm, I'm of the opinion that elders should be somewhat older. Now I, I know, you know, the verse that they go to is over in 1 Timothy. I think it's 1 Timothy. And this is the verse they go to when, when now, now this is not to take away from Elder Mott. He was a heck of a preacher even when he was 18 years old. Not to take away from him. Um, but he was an 18 year old kid. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter um, 4 and verse 12, Paul says, Let no man despise thy youth. And so they will say, well, see, he was young. He was a kid. Well, he wasn't really a kid. When you think about it, Timothy was born in 17 AD. 
Paul wrote this letter in about 63 AD. He was in his mid-40s. And Paul says, let no man despise thy youth, when he was already in his mid-40s. So I'm of the opinion here that elder means elder. The guy's got a couple of gray hairs. He's lived a few years. You know, one of, the, one of the qualifications is that he's the husband of one wife and has children that are not accused of riot or being unruly. You don't accuse a two-year-old of rioting or being unruly. All two years old, two-year-old kids are riotous and unruly. That would disqualify everybody. But once they get to be teenagers, how, how is he dealing now? How are they now? Um, so anyway, that's just, you can take that for what it's worth, but that's, that's my opinion on this. Now he says here, speaking to these elders, um, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. This word overseer comes from the Greek word um, episkopos, uh, which is translated in other places as bishop. If you look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, it says that he that desire the office of a bishop desireth a good work. That's the same word, episkopos. In Titus 1, 7, is translated as bishop there as well. The Greek word means one who has the responsibility of safeguarding or seeing to it that something is done in the correct way, a guardian. Um, and a bishop, an, oh, the, the definition of the word bishop is an overseer, a spiritual superintendent, ruler or director in the primitive church, a spiritual overseer, an elder or presbyter, one who has the pastoral care of a church. That's another name for the office that an elder holds. And that describes part of the work that he does. The elder oversees the church. And then he says, um, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. That word feed comes from the Greek word uh, poimeo, which means to serve as a tender of sheep, to herd, to tend, uh, to lead to pasture, to watch out for other people um, as a pastor does. It's the word for pastor. A pastor feeds sheep, takes care of sheep. When they break something, they, he fixes it. He mends them, he cares for them, he watches out for them. That's the other part of the job. In, in John chapter 21, in verse 16, Well, look at verse 15 to get the context here. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto them, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto them, unto him, Feed my sheep, or my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. He didn't hear me the last two, <laughs> didn't hear me the last, well remember that Peter had denied him three times. So Christ is asking him three times whether he loved him or not. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord thou knowest all things Thou knowest that I love thee, Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. That's the other part of the job of a pastor. We're to oversee the church and we're to take care of the, of the sheep. We're not to go out and try to make a name for ourselves. We're not to go out and try to save the world. We're not to get a bunch of signs and go up and down the street con condemning lost people for, for what, that's not our job. Our job is to take care of the, of the portion of the flock that God has put under our oversight. That's why we're here. That's, that's really the job that we try to do. Um, 
The word pastor in the English is a shepherd, one that has the care of flocks and herds, or a minister of the gospel who has the charge of a church and a congregation whose duty is to watch over the people of his charge and instruct them in the sacred doctrines of the Christian religion. And this word um, that we see for feed is also translated over in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 where it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors. That's the word that's translated feed over in Acts. Pastors and teachers. Um, so since Paul is here addressing elders, bishops, pastors, telling them what their responsibility is relative to their office, this applies directly to elders, bishops, pastors today. It's the same thing. Our job is the same as it was for those in Ephesus, to take care of the church that God has put under our charge. Nothing more, nothing less. Just take care of the people that God put under our charge. That's why we're here. Um, how are we doing? We can move on a little bit. Um, oh, let me, let me, I only got to verse 28. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He knew that false teachers would come in and scatter that church. He knew it would happen. How did he know it would happen? Because it had only happened in every church he'd ever started. And that's one of the main things that we look, have to look out for. That's one of the main concerns that falls on an elder, is to watch out for wolves, because they're gonna sneak into the church. It's not a if, it's a when. Because Satan's only got so many arrows in his quiver, to, to use Nancy Pelosi's <laughs> example. He only, he's only got so many tricks up his sleeve. There's only so many, and he does the same ones over and over and over and over again. And so that's one of the things you gotta watch out for. Because it happened, it's happened down through history, and it continues to happen. I know that they'll sneak in also of your own selves. Check this one out. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now brethren I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Remember, he had worked as a tent maker in many places. Did his own job and so, so that he, he wouldn't be chargeable. I have showed you all things how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. And that's about where we're going to lay it, let off for today. Um, and then next week, we'll go ahead and hopefully we'll go ahead and finish up. I thought we would get a lot farther today than than we did, but I keep talking too much. Um, you know what? I might be able to. Twenty-one. 
No, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and end it for today, um, and we'll uh, we'll we'll pick up here next week and and we'll get him into Jerusalem and probably get him arrested and 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 uh, held. Um, there's some interesting interesting things coming relative to to who he has to stand before. Um, and so I want to be able to give you some of the background of some of the people like Festus and Felix and um, Agrippa and who, who these guys were and uh, some of their background so you understand some of what was going on and who it was, why they did certain things that they did, why they would leave him prisoner for years and never get around to call him, what was, what was going on in their minds at that time. Um, and then we'll finally get him, eventually we'll get him to Rome. Um, and then after Rome, um, it gets, after Rome it gets, it gets to where we're, different people have different ideas of where he went and what he did. There are clues in the Bible that, that give us an idea of where he went and some of the things he did, but we don't really know the order. So that you're going to have one man say one thing and somebody else say something else relative to this, but none of us really know. We, we've we got some statements in history, we've got some clues in the Bible, certain things that weren't accomplished yet by the time Luke says sayonara. There's still a bunch of stuff left that that Paul would have had to have finished, so it had to fall in that in that last period of time. So anybody that you find that believes that the pastoral epistles of, of <clears throat> First and Second Timothy and Titus are, are inspired and were written by Paul has to come to the conclusion that he did something after that first stay in Rome. Um, hopefully next week I'll get us at least, well we'll get down the road a little ways, at least get him at least get him into Jerusalem and on his way to Rome. And then within a few weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up with that, Lord willing. So with that, I thank you for your kind and patient attention this morning. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.